So it's five o'clock. I'll call the meeting to order now. Um, this is the meeting of the Committee on City Services and the Committee on Legislative Matters uh, for May 2nd, 2022. Um, so um, Marianne Labarge is not here yet. I don't see her yet. Um, I guess we could just do the roll for city services, Pam. Absolutely. I'm just, uh, so I've made all of the city councilors a co-host. And if you wouldn't mind just keeping an eye on whether or not there's anybody in the waiting room while I'm doing the roll call. Okay, so Councilor Foster. I'm here. Councilor Gore. Here. Councilor Perry. Here. And Councilor Labarge. Here she comes. She's coming in right now. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, Councilor Labarge. We just began the meeting and I'm in the middle of doing the roll call and I just want to confirm that you are here. Councilor Labarge, are you here? I'm here. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, great. Thanks, Pam. Um, so just an announcement that this meeting and all who are on it are being audio and video recorded. Um, is there any members of the public who would like to make a public comment at this time? If you're a member of the public and you would like to make a public comment, you can raise your virtual hand. What's that? Keep your comment to two to three minutes, but it's not time strictly like full council meeting. So I see one hand, Andy Anderson. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, so I'm Andy Anderson. I'm with Voter Choice Massachusetts, and I just wanted to comment a little bit about the benefits of ranked choice voting and why this is an important uh, way of voting um, that I hope to see Northampton adopt. So the goal here is to have the best representation possible for the various offices in the city of Northampton. Um, the, there are several ways that people go about doing this for cities and so on, and uh, uh, Northampton is a mixture of them. So they have districts for the city council, for example, and the districts are designed hopefully to provide some representation uh, across the city um, with the assumption that geography is going to uh, be conclusive in getting fair representation. Um, the idea of representation here, uh, we can go back to John Adams, the second president of the United States and uh, writer of the Massachusetts Constitution, which is the uh, oldest extant operating constitution in the world and uh, uh, provide a lot of the ideas for the US Constitution. He once commented that the greatest care should be employed in constituting representative, a representative assembly it should be a miniature an exact portrait of the people at large. It should feel reason and act like them to do strict justice at all times. Um, more recently, we can quote Elizabeth Warren, who succinctly says, if you don't have a seat at the table, you might end up on the menu. So the goal here with ranked choice voting is to ensure a, a fair representation of all members of the public. So it, um, the way it goes about doing this is in two ways. First off, it institutes a um, system for eliminating the weakest candidates and allowing subsequent rounds of voting uh, where individuals get to vote again, everybody. Either they vote for their first choice if they're still in the race, or if their candidate has been eliminated, they get to vote for the next choice. 
and this is done in a compact way in a single election. And the result is to avoid vote splitting. So similar candidates, votes coalesce, and people who have similar ideas can get a representative at the table. The other way it goes about doing this is if there are multiple seats that are being elected, such as for uh, uh, two at-large seats on the city council and the uh, school board and so on, um, it wants to, it, just, it has a system for making sure that votes don't all pile up on one very popular candidate, but instead get distributed uh, from the top down so that the majority still has control of the city council um, or other body that uh, it's distributed, makes sure that votes coalesce at the bottom to provide representation, but it also uh, distributes at the top to ensure majority control, which is what we expect in a democracy. And it does this again by looking at taking some of the vote from the uh, candidate who has enough votes to win and distributing them the excess to second choices of people who voted for that candidate. So it's a very fair system. It's known mathematically to work very well. It's used in a number of cities and it's uh, uh, really a very great way to ensure representation in the city. So that's a basic summary that I'd like to provide. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Are there any other people here for public comment? Okay, don't see any other hands. Um, so now we'll go to items referred to committee. Um, we're gonna do the facial recognition ordinance review and Javier and Katie from ACLU are here to talk about the facial recognition ordinance review. Um, you can provide an overview of your thoughts and um, then the committee members will ask questions. So Javier and Katie can take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Gore. Um, thank you so much to the, to the rest of the committee for being here. Uh, Councilman uh, Garrick Perry, Councilman Malton, Councilor Jared, Councilwoman Lavarge, uh, Councilwoman Karen Foster. Um, three years ago in 2019, uh, the Northampton City Council passed unanimously a ban on the use of faces revealing technology as a municipal law. Uh, unanimously was really important. We had passed these bans uh, all across the Commonwealth, from Boston, Somerville, to all the way to Springfield, East Hampton, and Northampton. Uh, this has been really important for the work that uh, protecting the privacy and the civil rights of people across the Commonwealth with a technology that is not... Uh, at the federal level regulated, right? Um, we have had, I have had conversations with, with different of you, uh, passing by and talking a little bit about this, talking about this technology. Today, what we're planning to do with my colleague, Kate, is to answer questions, to talk a little bit about our position in relationship to, to the review of the ordinance, but also, uh, my colleague Kate, we will is going to be talking about her experience and what came out with the commission that was created in the legislature uh, to study the use of facial recognition software. So I'm uh, I'm gonna give pass to my colleague Kate Crawford. Thanks, Javi. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chair and uh, Councilors. My name is Cade Crockford. I run something called the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. I'm based in Boston, where I live. Um, as Javi said, we were really happy to work with the Northampton City Council uh, some years back to pass one of the first uh, prohibitions on municipal government use of facial recognition technology in the Commonwealth. Um, since then, a number of other communities have followed suit, most recently the city of Worcester, which passed a ban on face surveillance um, just a few months ago, um, becoming the eighth community in the state to do so. Um, and we're having conversations with folks in a few municipalities 
in other communities um, that are hoping to follow suit. So your example in Northampton has inspired many people across the Commonwealth um, to take similar action, uh, including, as Javi said, um, the four largest communities in the state, um, Boston, Springfield, Worcester, and Cambridge. Um, so we launched this campaign in 2019 um, because we were really concerned about what I think is a uniquely dangerous technology for a couple of reasons. Um, facial surveillance is dangerous when it works and when it doesn't. And there is a lot of evidence to, to lead us to the conclusion that the technology is not very good yet, particularly for um, some of the most pernicious uses, some of the um, types of facial recognition deployment that raise the most serious civil rights and civil liberties concerns, namely its use for surveillance. Um, so you've probably seen in movies like, you know, the, the Bourne trilogy and, and other like spy thrillers um, that uh, facial recognition technology can be used to analyze video data. So, you know, information from surveillance cameras um, can be used to track people uh, across cameras, to locate people uh, in a crowd, for example. This is one of the most dangerous uses of the technology in our view, um, both because it enables governments and in some cases corporations to follow where people go in, in public space um, depending on the size of the surveillance network, you know, from the moment they leave their home in the morning until the moment they return at night. Um, it also happens to be a form of facial recognition technology that is not um, very sophisticated yet, technologically speaking. Um, high, high error rates have been found when the technology has been tested on live video in places like England in recent years some cases with uh, error rates up to 90%. Um, and so that's one concern. There are also other concerns related to reliability. So there have been a number of studies that have shown that facial recognition technology performs more poorly when analyzing the faces of women, people with darker skin, young people, children, and elderly people. So you must be wondering, who, who does that leave? <laughs> the answer is middle-aged white men <laughs> is the demographic for whom the technology works the best um, generally. So there are reliability and accuracy concerns. There are also pretty substantial civil rights and civil liberties concerns that interestingly are actually heightened in some cases when the technology improves, the, you know, the better it gets. Um, Councillor Benu and Campin, a city councilor in Somerville, who was the leader of our effort to, to pass a, sur a face surveillance ban there, uh, actually the first community in Massachusetts to do this, put it nicely when he said that government use of facial recognition is, is akin to um, the government requiring everyone to tattoo a barcode on their forehead that is only readable by the government. So that you know, wherever you go, you can essentially be scanned and your presence documented or your identity uh, checked. And in this country, we don't do that. We don't live in a papers please society um, where the government can just go up you know, to anybody at any time and say, you know, give me your papers. I want to know who you are and what you're doing here. So that's another concern that we have um, about about the unregulated use of this technology. So Javier asked me to speak a little bit about what the, the commission uh, at the state level did. So I'll just do that quickly and then I'd be happy to answer any questions that folks have. I was a commissioner on a legislative commission that was established by the Massachusetts state legislature in the omnibus police reform legislation that passed at the end of 2020. Um, this commission was created to study the use of facial recognition, some of the accuracy and bias issues, uh, some use cases, look at what other uh, communities, other states, other countries are doing with respect to regulation, and then um, have a conversation about what, if any, 
regulations ought to be in place in Massachusetts to protect the public interest uh, with respect to government use of this technology. And so we concluded that process a few months ago and uh, published a report that was uh, endorsed by the ACLU, the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, um, New England Association, um, the, uh, um, who else endorsed the report? The Mass Bar Association, um, the Committee for Public Counsel Services, which is the state's public defender's office, as many of you know. Um, the attorney general's designee supported the report and actually the state police uh, designee supported the report among many other people, including experts, lawmakers, et cetera. And so it's a pretty, pretty impressive group of people to get to agree to, uh, to, to agree on, on an issue that's, uh, you know, potentially controversial, or at least that, you know, may be likely to spark disagreement between civil libertarians and the police. Um, and what did the re report recommend? Well, it recommended that the legislature pass a law to require that um, police have to get a warrant to use, uh, to perform a facial recognition search, that the process throughout the state where, uh, whereby the police could request a facial recognition search be centralized at the state police, um, so in other words, you know, the Northampton police would not have their own facial recognition technology. Somebody on the commission who's in law enforcement put it this way, you know, that does, he said, that doesn't bother me. I don't object to that. You know, when we take a rape kit, for example, we don't do that testing in house. We send it to a lab, right? So it's sort of a similar concept. Um, instead of every police department in the state having their own facial recognition technology, um, they would there would just be one system that the state police runs. And in order for you know, any police department, Northampton, any other, to request that, that, uh, that a search be performed by the state police in a criminal investigation to try to identify someone um, you know, from an image, uh, the, the commission recommended that the police would be required to get a warrant, to go to a judge, get a warrant, and take that image with the warrant to the state police and say, you know, we'd like you to use facial recognition to try to identify this person. The commission also recommended that there be due process protections attached to that process so that criminal defendants who were subjected to facial recognition searches would be notified so that they would have an opportunity to challenge the use of that technology to um, seek more information about the search, about who performed the search, the kinds of training that that person went through, um, the technology that was used to perform the search and other information. And that the commission also recommended that the use of facial recognition in criminal investigations, again, centralized through the state police, be limited to the most serious types of criminal investigations. The report also recommended that the legislature prohibit the use of facial recognition for that more dangerous, uh, pernicious type of deployment that I mentioned before, which is for surveillance. Um, so we are very supportive of that recommendation. It also recommended that the legislature um, pass a, a law saying that um, the government cannot use what's called affect recognition or emotion analysis technology which purports to be able to identify how someone is feeling based on the physical characteristics of their face. I, I don't think I have to tell you that that could, that could turn out really bad, <laughs> especially for some of us who have what is known as resting bitch face. <laughs> excuse me, excuse my French. <laughs> um, and so th those were among the many recommendations that the, the uh, Legislative Commission uh, forwarded to the legislature. And so what's happening now is the Judiciary Committee, which was responsible for overseeing this commission, the chairs are um, Representative Mike Day on the House side and Senator Jamie Eldridge on the Senate side. Their teams are working on some legislation right now um, which we hope will be favorably reported out of Judiciary soon and we hope will pass this legislative session. So that's the update from the state side. Um, 
and I'm happy to, to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. Um, it was really informative. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Councilor Labarge? Thank you. Um, Cade, I have, I have a, I would like to talk with Cade. Yes, please. Hi, thank you, Cade. Anyways, I am curious because I just heard you talking about the committee in, in the state working on an issue which I feel is really serious, is facial recognition, even as counselors. We have no protection at all, at all, with the Zooming or no matter what, even if we're at council chambers. And it happened to us with the defunding the police, okay? And we were given a five minute break, a five minute break. I forgot to shut off my camera, but previous to that, I have nothing to hide here. I received two calls, Kate, from my brother from Georgia. Okay, I'm his only sister, sibling, and he was very concerned because of the protesting that had occurred where the protesters were going to every counselor's home. Okay, so he wanted to make sure I was okay and my family. Anyways, I did not answer those two calls. Immediately when it was announced we could go on a five minute break, the call came in. Thank God I had a witness here, which was Ruth McGrath, because I also had difficulties with my computer. So she was here from where to help me out to make sure that my computer would be operable. Well, I got on the phone, not realizing I did not shut off my camera, Kate. An accusation was made from the police department in our city that us counselors had changed our mind with our voting while we went on break. Plus the fact I was looked at big time as apparently talking with a counselor on the phone. And for 20 years, I have never talked to any counselor on a break at city council, ever, ever. I was outraged with that. And anyways, I, my brother, I asked him to send a letter how he talked with me. And I told him how I was on a break at city council. Plus Ruth McGrath that was here with me also sent a letter to our city solicitor and to the police department. So where is the protection for counselors also? I feel there's none, none. Thank God we won our case. No question about it. Because I would have went further with this. If you're innocent, you have your rights to prove of being innocent. And I just thought it was awful because I didn't shut off my video. I'm learning to do working with Zooming and everything and completely forgot because of the two calls previously from my brother, not knowing if something happened to him. And then on break time, just as soon as I went on it, Ruth said, it's your brother again. I answered it. So here, an accusation is made. Every counselor apparently was talking on the phone, all right? And we changed our votes. That's a direct lie, a direct lie. So, but at least we were proven to be innocent. But where is the fine line? I believe in protecting people on the outside, but there is absolutely no protection for city counselors or even school committee members right down the line. That's, that's my feelings. Uh, Councilwoman yeah. Lavarch, I, 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 will, I will take this having in mind that I, I, I understand a little better the, the background context of what you are talking about, right? Um, and and, and it, it, it is complicated, isn't it? Because the, when we're talking about the open meeting law and, and serial communication and communication between elected officials, um, and at the same time, in the same track, you're having uh, conversations and arguments during city council that people feel really deep about it. Um, these kinds of assumptions can be made, right? Uh, as you said, this was fully investigated. 
was proved beyond, beyond doubt that a non-city council member at that point, if, if I remember well, this was 2020, uh, no city council at that point, city council member have violated open meeting law or communicated in any way. Um, and I think that you're you're correct in, in the frustration. Um, what, what what I would recognize is that when we're talking about situations or interactions that may happen during city council meetings, the expectation of privacy because of a meeting law in, in relation to communication between elected officials suddenly gets uh, diminished. And that's something that I can talk to you later next week or this week, we can get together. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any other questions from committee members? Oh, Councillor Nash, did you have a question? Councilor Gore. Uh, so my first question is, is legislative matters open? And um, am I part of the team that's, in other words, is legislative matters, uh, are they, uh, have they convened? And so therefore, I'm part of the, the folks asking questions here. Legislative matters hasn't convened yet, no. Okay, I will withhold my questions then. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Thank you. Um, Kate, I had a question for you then. Um, you were talking about under warrant, like there, there being a use for facial recognition under warrant. Um, and I'm just looking at our city ordinance, which just, which expressly prohibits using any city resources for any facial recognition. Um, and I'm wondering if this, if that's that state and federal law supersede in case of a warrant, or if that's something that we should be considering with this ordinance. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Councillor. Um, so the state, state law would preempt the local ordinance, but it's important to recognize that it wouldn't preempt the entire thing. Um, so it wouldn't preempt, for example, the portion of the ordinance that prohibits any Northampton entity from, um, you know, buying facial recognition technology, for example, right? Um, it would merely allow the Northampton Police Department to go through the process that's outlined in state law, you know, if we can get this done, to allow them to ask the state police to to perform a search on their behalf pursuant to the state law. Yeah, so the answer is yes and no. It would, it would preempt portions of the local ordinance, but not the whole thing. And you know, I just wanna say one more thing about that, which is that um, it's not clear if the legislature is going to act at all this session. It's also not, I mean, we hope they do, <laughs> just to be clear about that. We really hope they do, um, but that's not certain, obviously. And if they do, we're not sure what the scope of that regulation will be. In other words, whether it will only apply to law enforcement or whether the legislature will, will contemplate regulating non-police government use of facial recognition because we haven't really talked about it today, but I, we talked about it a few years ago when this ordinance passed. Um, schools can use this technology. You know, it could be used by the transportation department. There, are, there are a number of other um, government agencies outside of law enforcement that this ordinance also applies to. And you know, depending on what the state legislature does, we would have to kind of come back and see if. Um, see what po what portions of the Northampton ordinance are preempted by state law, and we just don't know yet. And just uh, to go a little deeper in what Katie's talking about, um, when we talk about the uh, uh, regulating and banning the use of facial surveillance, we we do not center these in law enforcement, right? Uh, a really good example right now: we passed a ban on the use of facial surveillance in Springfield. One of the big issues right now in Springfield. It's the, that the school committee signed an agreement with the police department 
And right now the police department has sort of unregulated access to the live feed of the cameras of every single public school in Springfield. We are really concerned about that, deeply concerned about civil liberties in relationship to that kind of access. At the same time, my thought is, thank God that we pass <laughs> the ban on the use of face surveillance technology, because if somebody is using an, uh, uh, a, a camera system to be able to do uh, live surveillance, pair, that paired with the use of the software, it's pretty detrimental, it's really dangerous. So we, this, the issue of facial surveillance go beyond uh, law enforcement. I have a question. Um, I was, I was really blown away by the fact that you said they have a uh, technology that can see your facial emotions. And I, I was just wondering, like, do you think this technology is going to go further and further into like being able to, to advance? Or do you think there's some way that we can kind of put a stop on the technology before it like advances to even more like outrageous things? Great question, counselor. Um, so, you know, the first amendment provides very broad protection for um, artistic and business innovation. Um, there's not a whole lot that the government can do to stop the development of technology. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing you know, that the government is not playing a role in determining what people can create. However, it is our view at the ACLU that the government must play a stronger role in regulating how these technologies can be used. And so um, that's why we're really grateful for the leadership that Northampton has shown um, for the state and for the country and frankly for the world that is grappling with these issues more and more every day. Um, you know, we're working on the government side of surveillance issues. We also are working on the corporate side. And so while our work does not involve trying to stop the development of new technologies, it does involve trying to ensure that the law protects people's civil rights and civil liberties with respect to how those technologies are used. And so an example with respect to the, you know, affect recognition and emotion analysis technology is, you know, there are some folks in the civil rights community who think that those technologies have no place in government. We are among those, you know, we, the worst case scenario would be to see in a courtroom in 10 years, you know, the police introducing evidence at trial that says, well, your honor, we have this artificial intelligence system that we use to analyze the video of this person saying, I didn't commit the crime. And the algorithm says that he was lying and he, you know, so we're gonna submit this as, as evidence. That's a terrible road for us to go down. So we think we ought to nip it in the bud now. That's what we're trying to accomplish at the state level. That's what you all have done in Northampton already. Um, but there's also, there are also ways that this technology can be used by private actors and are using it, in fact. We're on Zoom right now. Just last week, there was a report that said that Zoom is considering introducing some form of affect recognition into their technology. Some corporations that use video software for job interviews are using um, affect recognition in that process to help determine whether someone is you know, reliable, trustworthy, you know, excited, bored, whatever, um, during an interview. So um, there are folks who are working on, on that side as well, trying to get Congress, which is a little bit like, you know, banging your head up against a wall and also uh, state legislatures to take action to try to impose some, you know, bright red line regulations so that these technologies can't be used to hurt people in areas like, employment and housing and other areas where people are seeking services that they, you know, or, or um, uh, opportunities that they need in order to function in society. So yes, you're right. You know, there are a lot of areas where this technology um, can be used to, to, to harm people, frankly, 
it's our view at the ACLU that stopping technolo technological development is not only probably unconstitutional in many cases, but not really plausible. Um, and that the, the thing that the government ought to be doing at the local, state, and federal levels is regulating how these technologies can be used to make sure that they can't hurt people. Thank you for that question. Councilor Perry. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Kate and Javier, for explaining some of this stuff. Um, my question really comes down to uh, data and storage of data. A lot of the discussion that came around dash cams recently was about um, not necessarily using facial recognition, but where the data is going to be stored. And I was wondering if there's any regulation down the pipeline about how long certain companies can hold on to data. Um, you know, I know that you said that, you know, the on the federal level, they can start requisitioning some of the data. And, you know, if you could maybe explain that a little more, that would help. Yeah, so um, we don't have any real data privacy law in Massachusetts. Um, it's something that we uh, at the ACLU have been working on this legislative session. A bill that we are supporting is called the Massachusetts Information Privacy Act, um, which would create some bright line rules with respect to how companies can you know, collect and process and share uh, personal data. I think on the um, government contract side, you know, the probably the best place to apply that kind of pressure is in the contract that the city signs with a given um, technology manufacturer to say, you know, we agree to pay you X amount of money and you agree that you're going to, you know, purge the records every 30 days or whatever. You know, the one thing that the city needs to be careful of when you're, you know, thinking about data storage is the public records law. Um, because there are mandatory retention requirements under state law, um, which are good. You know, you don't want <laughs> you don't want a government official deleting all their emails every day so that nobody can ever find out what they, what they were saying or doing. And when the government in, engages in a contract with a company to procure something like dash cams or something like that, all the data that's collected through that technology is also subject to the public records law and the state records retention requirements. So it's a little bit of a balance between, you know, making sure that you're not in violation of state law with respect to records retention, but also trying as much as you can to ensure that the data is not kept for longer than necessary. And most crucially, is not shared with anyone absent the city's knowledge and approval. So you know, those are the, those are the kinds of things that I think it's important to get written in a contract. You know, I've read some terrible contracts that cities have signed with technology providers that essentially give the technology provider the rights to use the data however they want, and that would be a bad model for a, a public entity to pursue. And Council Perry, just just to add a little bit to that, and. In, in situations when when municipal entities they got, got get get into a contract, many times you have also the thing about how when the municipality has to take a decision about what kind of material is created within the municipal structure. What kind of material do you, do I wanna have to get a point when I'm you know I'm storing hours of video to the cloud? What are the risks? We saw, for example, during the Trump administration, the targeting of undocumented folks uh, in different levels, right? Uh, we know that in California, they were being targeted uh, using automatic plate readers. Um, so also uh, retention, the contract is extremely important, but I also want to sort of throw to the mix the fact that sometimes the municipalities and, 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 gover and government institutions has, have to ask themselves, if the material they are about to create is storage, it, it's worth doing it, right? The most secure material is the one that you do not create. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, well, thank you, Javier and Katie. Appreciate you coming. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll do it. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, would you consider that if we, uh, I think some members of Legislative Matters have uh, questions, if we were to convene that, then they could participate? Yeah. Great. Um, so Pam, would you call the roll for Legislative Matters? I will definitely do that. Uh, Councilor Jarrett? Here. Councilor Elkins? Here. Councilor Moulton? Here. And Councilor Nash? Here. And just for the record, I'm gonna state that the, um, the Legislative Matters uh, Committee convened at 5.40 p.m. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Moulton. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I have a question or a couple of questions uh, to follow up on uh, Councilor Foster's um, uh, question about uh, the uh, legislation, state legislation superseding a local ordinance. <clears throat> My interpretation of the Northampton ordinance, it states that it shall be unlawful for any city official to expend any city resources to obtain, retain, access, or use any face surveillance system. I interpret that very broadly, right? particularly the word resources. Uh, I interpret that to include money, spend money, time, to spend any time by city officials, or anybody representing the city. If, uh, if the, if, is that interpretation correct? And if, if the legislature passes uh, uh, legislation which adopts the major recommendations of the commission, which portions of the Northampton ordinance would be superseded and which would be left in effect? Um, Councilor, I think I missed the beginning of your question because my computer was acting up, but I think I get the gist of it so I can try to answer it. Um, the portions of the only the only thing in the ordinance that would not I mean it's sort of hard to know because the legislature um, is still working on this bill, but um, you know if they do what the recommendations say, then the only thing that would change is that the Northampton Police Department would be able to get a warrant or in an emergency not get a warrant and take a photograph of someone that they want to identify in a uh, felony investigation and send it to the state police. And the state police would be able to do a facial recognition search on that image and um, return information about it to the Northampton police for that criminal investigation. Also, uh, uh, Council Moulton, you're your understanding of resources without getting into uh, the piece of legislation statewide, it's correct. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why if, 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 if the members of the council take a look to the different uh, ordinances that we have passed uh, across the Commonwealth, I think Northampton is one of the few that says, rather than saying no city official, no city resources. And that's uh, certainly in, 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 in direct relationship to uh, the understanding of the power of the city council and the charter. And that, that, that's the reason of that, of that phrasing and the framing. But I have to say your understanding of the, the, your definition of resources is accurate to the intention. Thank you. Councilor Nash. Thank you, Councillor Gore. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. I'm in my car. I'm trying this technology for the first time. So anyway, uh, so uh, Kate and Javier, thank you so much for being here today. This is really great. And that, um, and I guess the, the big question is in terms of our facial recognition ordinance, do, I, my understanding from previous conversations we had uh, that you recommend no changes, correct? Correct. That's right. Cool. 
that sounds great. So we're on the mark with that. And then uh, thing is that that in I, in my mind this is uh, this is not just about facial recognition. This is about more broadly about surveillance protections in general. And one of the things that came up while we were discussing uh, dashboard cameras was a, a lot of concern about uh, license plate reading technologies. And there were some instances in California where uh, data like that had been collected. Uh, and it, it, it wasn't quite, it, from what I recall of the situation is, is that uh, it's not clear if it was intentional or not, but a lot of data had been co collected as uh, 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 by cruisers on, on a highway. And that, um, so my thought is this, is that uh, does the ACLU have a position on uh, license plate reading technology or is that something we can expect coming down the road? We do. Yes, counselor, we do have a, um, a position on license plate readers. So license plate readers are a technology that um, anybody actually can use. You could buy one if you wanted to, <laughs> um, but governments use them quite a bit. Police departments use them. And what they do is they scan all the license plates of all the cars that pass by them. So some of them are stationary. They can be under bridges, on light poles, you know, like surveillance cameras, they can be anywhere. Others are on police cars or um, a big uh, user of these is actually uh, repo trucks that drive around communities. They, they often have license plate readers on them, collecting data from all the cars that they pass by um, there's a huge private industry that is dominated by a couple of companies that, you know, lease this technology to repo men and others, uh, and collect all of this data and then sell subscriptions to it, to government agencies, um, police departments, ICE, the FBI, et cetera. So essentially what this enables is the mass tracking of where everyone's driving all the time. Um, and so, you know, if you have a subscription to one of these services, you can type in someone's license plate number and you'll see a list of every time that that car was captured by one of these cameras, a picture, uh, the date and time and the geographic location where that um, surveillance took place. So there are, there are two different ways that this technology can be used by police. One is to find cars that they want to do some sort of enforcement action with so you know police officers who have a license plate reader on their on their squad car they may get an automatic alert if a car drives by them that is on a list right so it could be an amber alert it could be somebody who has an outstanding warrant could be somebody who's wanted by police for questioning whatever it is um that's one way but the other way the technology is used is essentially just dragnet mass surveillance of, of where everyone is going all the time. And these records can be used um, not just to know where someone is right now, but to know where someone was two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago, two decades ago, depending on how long the data is stored. Um, can be used to determine a pattern of someone's life, you know, when they usually drive down a given street, when they usually are home, when they're not, et cetera. Um, so we think that there ought to be state law to regulate license plate readers. Dozens of states, maybe I don't know, 20 or something like that, have passed laws regulating police use of license plate readers. Massachusetts is not one of them, unfortunately. There is legislation uh, that was filed this session that we support. We've been supporting license plate reader legislation for years now, although it hasn't passed the legislature, unfortunately. One of the key things that we think ought to be done is that there should be a limited retention period for those data. You know, the police frequently say, well, you know, if there's a murder in a neighborhood and there's a license plate reader nearby, we'd like to know what cars were in that area around the time of the murder, right? Or a kidnapping. Okay, that makes sense. So keep the data for a couple days then, right? Or a week or even two weeks. But beyond that, what you see is is not so much responding to actual incidents, 
but instead the, you know, the creation of this huge data pool that enables the tracking of not just people who are su suspected of crimes or serious of crimes, but everyone. So everyone in this meeting who has a car, your license plate reader data showing your movements is in one of these databases or probably multiple of them and can be accessed by police in Massachusetts at any time without any criminal suspicion whatsoever. So we think that's a problem, that that's wrong. You know, the, a fundamental principle in the United States is that the government should not be following you around, should not be tracking your movements, should not be invading your privacy unless they have a really good reason and get a warrant in most cases. Um, so anyway, we, that's the approach that we're taking in Massachusetts is to limit the retention period for uh, how long police can store this information. Um, and I can send you some follow-up information about that legislation if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be terrific. And yeah. thank you for scaring me. <laughs> I had no idea that, um, that that technology was used by the private sector um, in such um, yeah. robust uh, manner. That's quite frightening. So um, yeah, yes, so please send that to me. And, um, and in other words, um, at this time, in terms of our uh, surveillance ordinance, you wouldn't recommend adding anything around license plate reading at this time and with the idea that it's being looked into at the state level? Well, not necessarily. I mean, if, if you're interested in, in the subject, I, I, we would be happy to have a conversation about what an ordinance on license plate readers could look like in Northampton. Um, okay. Yeah. I look forward to having that conversation. Good. Um, I just I just want to add, um, Council President Nash. So in in 2019, the ACLU of California, based on a FOIA request, a public record, a federal level public record request, find out that uh, Vigilant Solutions, which is Vigilant at that time, was a smaller company that was later on acquired by Motorola Solutions. Uh, shared database with more than 9,000 ICE agents in, in, the, in the tracking of, uh, of, uh, of undocumented folks driving around. ICE agents, it's the Immigration and Cultural Enforcement uh, sort of uh, arm, arm of, uh, of DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and and that, in, that by itself was around 5 billion data points. And those data points comes, as Kate said, not only from law enforcement, but also from private entities and private buildings and private companies, right? Right. Um, so uh, more than eight, around 80 uh, law enforcement agencies have access to the database. So this comes down to, to how the technology is being used. And as Kate said, I mean, we can, we certainly, we can talk with city council if uh, members are interested on in moving uh, an ordinance in relationship to automatic plate reader. Sounds great. And I, I can see that Kate has already sent me something. Thank you. <laughs> We're fighting the technology and it's helping us at the same time. So thank hey, you. listen, that's, that's why our program is called Technology for Liberty. We're not against technology. We just yeah. think there needs to be rules of the road to protect people. Sounds great. Thank you for being here today. Council Perry? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, Council President Nash's question brings me to something that's on my mind is that, you know, when we when the council crafted this original facial recognition software, you know, we dealt with it and we've kind of baked in a let's review this in three years, which I, I think is very forward thinking. Um, you know, so we just talked about license plate readers. Is there any other technology we should be aware of or should consider if we are looking to plan some further legislation to handle, you know, what's coming down the road? It's a great question. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of different technologies at play. So one one option that some municipalities have adopted um, around data protection and data management and surveillance and privacy is to essentially conduct like a citywide audit, right? To see what kinds of technologies are in use in a municipality so that the legislative branch, you all can get a better hold of, you know, what protections exist, you know, what the current policies are like, uh, with respect to governing the use of those technologies in different city departments. Um, I think that that might be 
a good thing for Northampton to do if it's a, if it's if this is an issue that is important to to all of you, um, just to get a sense of what's happening right now in the government and um, to communicate to the mayor and the executive branch that the council has an interest in these issues and that you want to be involved in conversations and policy making with respect to you know not only what kinds of technologies are adopted but also how they're used um, and we at the aclu would be more than happy to to participate and to help you out this is something that we've done formally through ordinances in a number of communities in Massachusetts, Boston most recently. Um, but I think it can also be less formal, you know, if there's um, uh, a willing partner in the administration, which I assume there is in Northampton. So I'd be happy to, to work with you all on that too. Thank you. Council Lamarge. You're on mute. Thank you, Counselor. Um, anyways, Kate, I thank you very much um, for the offering of helping us, of moving on with this, because I think it is something that I am very interested in, in knowing what type of technology is being used throughout our city. And I agree about a citywide audit being done. I thank you for your help on this, and I'm pretty sure some of us counselors are going to be very interested having your help. Thank you. Thank you, counselor. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks again to Javier and Katie. I appreciate it. Um, so now we'll move on to ranked choice voting and Councilor Jarrett's gonna chair this portion. Hey, thank you, Councilor Gore. Um, <clears throat> so this is 22.072, an order for special legislation relative to ranked choice voting in the city of Northampton. Uh, and we have um, Bob Boris and Catherine Kay here um, <clears throat> to give a presentation. And I guess we'll, we'll do that presentation first and um, then uh, look for a motion um, with regard to each of the committees will need, we'll need to make a recommendation back to the city council. So uh, welcome. Um, Bob and Kathy. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, don't want to be repetitive of what uh, was said in front of the council and I'm eager to hear any questions that the committees have. Um, so in anticipation of hearing questions, the committee um, suggests a resource which we can provide to you um, which deals with a lot of the mechanics and, uh, and the philosophy of ranked choice voting and provides an opportunity for you um, later on, if you wish to get into some of the weeds to, to find out how it works. But it's a, it's a descriptive document, it's a resource. And if it's okay with you, um, I'll just go through that quickly now. And then perhaps that will inform some of the questions that, that will come up. Is that, is that okay? That's, that's, what, that's what the committee determined would be the best way to, to be helpful tonight. So what I'm, all right? Yeah, that sounds great to me. Okay, so Anyone? what I'm gonna endeavor to do is share my screen. Okay, um, this, this document comes from FairVote, which is a, an organization that we relied on, um, you know, in the time that, in the time that we've, done our deliberations. Um, and I just want to go through this um, to suggest some things that are important to understand. Um, the, we liked, we liked this, this, this resource um, because it presents a ballot. Um, certainly an understanding of the ballot is critical to understanding how ranked choice voting works. 
similar, similarly, uh, the education effort uh, to implement ranked choice voting will depend on our ability to, to have our voters understand how the ballot works. And beyond that, to hopefully encourage them to embrace the ballot in all of its manifestations, that is to say, to use it as its design. So as you, as you can see in this particular council race, there's, there's six people running and you get to rank them from, up, from one to six. You, you know, and the notion is you only mark one, one um, oval in each column and you, you complete all the rankings from one to six. Now, if you don't wanna do that, you don't have to. Um, if you only wanna rank number one, that's, that's up to you. But again, I think it's very important, certainly from an education standpoint, for voters to understand why it is in their interest to mark all the ballots. And that's something that, that the city can consider um, should it get to the point where education is, the, is on the table. Um, the, the power of ranked choice voting is that it, it provides a greater degree of representation and a better expression of what the voters' intentions are by virtue of the fact that, that of the way that votes are counted. So if you're a voter and you have a chance to select a number one candidate, you also have a chance to select a number two. And, and, and therefore, you can be impactful on not just one person winning, but more than one person winning. Um, also, in the, in the way that the votes are tallied, which you'll see in a moment, and we'll again offer to show that little two minute cartoon that we saw at the city council just to affirm some of these things. But the way that the math works in the transferring of excess votes from candidates who are deemed to have been elected, that means they've collected enough votes to exceed the threshold, which, we'll, which this document will show in just a moment. So in the transferring of excess votes from candidates who have exceeded the threshold and the transfer up of, of candidates who will not be elected, um, those actions in, in totality and in combination end up with a more representative result reflective of the demographic of a community. That's, that's the power of ranked choice voting. That's how it works. Um, you know, I lived in Cambridge for 15 years. I saw that happen. And that's the power of ranked choice voting. And, and one hopes that that's the reason that 68% of our electorate you know, endorsed it on the, on the most recent um, election. But so if you go through this document, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see a number of, of things that are important to know. Um, calculating the threshold is one of them. You know, if you're running for election, you wanna know what it's gonna take um, to get elected. And in the case of ranked choice voting, it's a function of how many seats are up for the position that that um, you're going for. So if it's if you're in a if you're in a one seat race, um, as seven of seven of you are, it's the majority. The majority gets elected, fifty percent plus one vote. Um, if you're running for two seats, um, as 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 um, two of you would be, or two of you get elected, um, what what would be required to be deemed elected to to exceed the threshold? is if you get 33% of the number of votes cast plus one. The way the formula works is the number of seats plus one divided by the number of votes cast creates the threshold. And then you add one to that. Um, so what effectively that means is if you get, if you're running for an at-large race and you, and you collect 33% of the votes, plus one, you are deemed to be elected. Um, knowing what the threshold is, is important because it then determines who has excess votes 
and how excess votes are distributed in the, in the subsequent rounds of ballot counting. Um, again, this um, document, if you go through it, talks about these things. Um, it gives some clarity to exactly how they work. Um, I'd, I'd like to suggest now that we, we just take, take a minute and review what we saw last week and it, and it might refresh our memories and perhaps it'll, it'll, it'll help with what's gonna, is gonna come, come following. It's two minutes long, is that okay? Councilor Jarrett, is that okay? Okay, so let's watch this yes, one. Yes, absolutely. Let's watch this one more time. I wonder if I can do this. Well, for some reason, screen sharing is not gonna allow me to go from this document into the YouTube where it, where it can be found. Um, I might be able to do it. Let me try, let me try this. Okay, this opens another screen. Um, how it works. That's the same screen, that's the same screen. Okay, this is, let's see what happens if I do this. Well, my apologies. Um, you saw it before, if, um, you know, if you wanna come back later, th th this was linked to the agenda and you can come back and look at it at your, at your convenience. It, it does describe the proportional transfer of votes, um, but I have another way to show that. Um, and that is down here at the bottom, here is a proportional example of how votes are transferred in, a, in, a, in an election, okay? So, um, you know, to vote, we, you know, that's how the voters vote to determine winners. You, you calculate the threshold. Um, and, and it talks about that. And so here's a, little, here's a little diagram as to how the algorithm works. You count the votes. Are there any candidates above the threshold? If yes, they are deemed to be elected. And then what would happen at that moment is if they have any excess votes, if they have votes above the threshold, those votes would be, um, would be algebraically um, proportionally transferred to the second to the second choices. Okay, so you make those choices, then you go back as a result of doing the excess transfers, is anyone else above the threshold? If the answer is yes, you repeat that iteration. If as a result of the transfer of surplus votes, there is no one above the threshold, then you go to the, the no um, limb and then you would eliminate the last place candidates and the number two votes given to the last place candidates would then be transferred up and you would again then observe, is anyone crossing the threshold now? Um, understand that um, unlike how Cambridge does this, which, is, uh, which always was a fairly manual process, um, the Dominion software that we use uh, does it automatically. So, you know, it's fairly instantaneous and um, the city clerk would be able to provide election results as, as they are seen in the, in the, in the ballots that, that, have, that have been tabulated on the night of the election. What would remain for the next day would be, would be right in votes and others. But, but that's, that is sort of the example or that's sort of the graphing of how the, the algorithm works. And now, Here's, here's an example, um, and it's kind of instructive. It shows the result of a certain election. Six candidates are running for three seats. So if you know there are three seats, then this, the equation that we've suggested already says that the threshold or the, or the limit, the number of seats that you need to get to be deemed to be elected is three seats 
plus one or four seats divided into the number of votes plus one. That's how it goes. Um, this example talks about the representation in, in that particular election and how the result provides a more representative outcome. Um, but what I, what I wanna show you, the, the power of this particular graphic here is that it gives a good description of how the allocation of votes proceeds until three candidates are elected. Um, as you can see in round one, uh, candidate Perez got 27 point, well, 27.2 percent of the votes or 2,500 votes. You know that with 9,200 people voting, and the the um, threshold calculations divide that by four and add one, um, the threshold is 2,300 votes. So, conveniently, a round number. So. Um, counselor or, or candidate Perez is the only candidate to exceed the threshold. And he does that by, by 200 votes. So he has, he has 2,500, he only needs, uh, he only needs 2,300. 20, so he has 200 votes to be transferred. Um, that transfer occurs in round two where you see that proportionally you divide the 200 votes that he has um, to transfer by the, by the 2,500 votes he got. And that, that provides a percentage which is used um, against all of the number two votes that voted for um, candidate Perez and they're allocated to the other candidates. So you'll notice in round two, that the candidate Perez has gone from 2,500 to the 2,300 votes he needed and the other candidates have come up a bit. Mm -hmm. However, you will also note in round two that no one has exceeded the threshold. So what happens is the lowest um, vote total among the candidates is eliminated. In this case, that's candidate Smith um, her 1,000 votes are then allocated up to all the number two votes in the 1,000 votes that were made for her. You will note as a result of that transfer up in round three, there is still no one who exceeds the threshold. So the next lowest candidate, which is candidate Jackson, um, his, 13, his 1,450 votes are then allocated. And as a result of that allocation, all of a sudden, candidate Chan now exceeds the threshold. So you have two of the three candidates deemed to be elected. And um, for round five, what remains to do is to eliminate candidate Lorenzo being the lowest vote getter in the round. You allocate his votes up. And, and as a result of that, candidate Hannah Murphy um, is deemed to be elected. And you have the three votes um, that uh, the three candidates uh, filling the seats because they have now exceeded the threshold. This is how the allocation of surplus votes and the allocation of votes from candidates not having a chance to be elected occurs. Um, what you see as a result of all of this in this particular district is um, a case where the majority being the Democrats got two candidates in and the minority being the Republican got one candidate in. So, this particular system is, is judged to be um, a better representation of what the intentions of, of, of all 9,200 people who cast, cast ballots in that election uh, were. Um, you can, if you want to read through this, it might give a better description to what I tried to abridge for you. Um, but but that, that, in essence, is how um, 
how the system how the system works the the um, challenge or the op the opportunity let's say the opportunity for us um, is to convey to the voters in Northampton that it is it is in their personal interest to use rank choice voting the way it was it was designed uh, to be used there are you know you know a number of people have spoken leading up to now as to what other attributes of of the of the of the methodology are and, and they include you know you don't have to do preliminaries and um and such uh but that that in a nutshell is 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 kind of the nuts and bolts of of how it of how it works the the committee as i mentioned in front of the council last time the committee uh, analyzed all the various configurations of uh, of this how it can be set up and there's a number of different ones and the one that we have selected to be used which is characterized by what you just saw is called the the weighted inclusive Gregory method, it's the one that Amherst uses, it's, it's, the, it's the most pop, popular one. And we, we judged it to be most responsive to the criteria that I outlined to you last week. And I don't wanna be repetitive to that, but um, I hope that we, we hope that this resource can be helpful to you. Uh, we hope that it, moving forward, the city has an opportunity to create its own resources, which we can, which we can use to educate people. And, but that's that's a step down the road. We have to get it. The, the council has to decide what their pleasure is, and then we need to get it through the legislature before we can um, appropriately address the educational opportunities and, and options that we that we know about. So. With that, what I'm gonna attempt to do if I can is stop sharing my screen. Yep, and I'm back. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you so much. It was very helpful. Um, so yeah, let's take some questions first from members of the committees and then uh, from members of the public, if, if there are any. Uh, Councillor Elkins. I, uh, I was just gonna say that I, if I could be, oh, uh, if I could share the screen, I actually pulled up the video and could play if that's helpful to anybody. I'm also content yeah. to let people if they want to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, let's see. I think this if you playing. if you have your earbuds in it automatically defaults to that so you might have to do uh, so uh so am i hearing you say that i need to change the audio okay yes let me try again all right Yeah, and I'm seeing in the chat to share your audio. Sorry, you were seeing. Okay, I'm going to try again. Oh, 
vote for your favorite color. Oh, we are not seeing, uh, we're seeing a different window. Oh, okay. <laughs> have too much. Okay, one more time. The sound. Uh, one more time. Okay, I think this is gonna do it. Huh? <laughs> Vote for your favorite color. The instant runoff way. Instead of voting for just one color, you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, then I want blue. And if neither of those wins, then I guess I could live with yellow. Now let's count up everybody's votes. Under instant runoff rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority. More than 50% of the votes. So, purple's ahead, but it only has seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate whoever's in last place. Sorry, yellow fans. We're going to your second choice. Two more for pink. One for purple. No one has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye, bye, bye blue. blue. Three for purple. Two for pink. And we have a winner. The instant runoff way. Um, that was the single seat example. We were, it would be good council if you could, if you could do the multi seat. Right. Give me one second and I'll, uh, Vote for your favorite colors. The instant runoff way. Now with fractions. There you go. Is this it? Yep. Works. But we're not seeing it. We're hearing it. It's a little more complicated. We have five. It's all too much. It's all too much. Oh, we got the same thing. Wrong screen. Yep. Not, Wrong not screen. the right window. Yep. The problem is, is I have it, it shows up as two screens. Just a second. Because I, I have it. Uh... That should be it. Is that it? Yes, it is. Yay! <laughs> Got it. The instant runoff way. Now, with fractions. We already showed you how instant runoff elections work when there's only one winner. But when there's more than one winner, it's a little more complicated. We have five colors to choose from, and we're going to end up with three winners. To start, each voter chooses a favorite color, a second and a third. All right, purple is my first choice. Yellow comes in second, and I'll put blue in third place. Now we need a scoreboard. There were 36 votes cast. There will be three winners. In order for a color to win, it needs more than a quarter of the vote. That's because if a color gets that much, then it's mathematically impossible for it to lose. 36 divided by four is nine, and we need just over that. So plus one. Is 10. 10 votes is the finish line. Make it there, and you're one of the three winners. So let's count the votes. No one's reached the finish line yet. That means it's time for round two. And Orange got the fewest votes, so it's out. Everyone who voted for Orange first now gets their second choice. Purple reached the finish line. In fact, purple has more votes than it needs. That means each purple voter can take back a fraction of their vote and still leave purple with enough to win. Under instant runoff rules, that's exactly what they get to do. Purple has two votes to spare. 
And that gets divided among the 12 purple voters. So each of them gets one sixth of their vote back. And that little piece will go to their next choice. Now blue has reached the finish line. No votes to spare. So no more fractions. Green is in last place. You know the drill. Most of these votes are from colors that have already won or are already out. We call those ballots exhausted. Yellow didn't quite make it to the finish line, but there's no one else left. So we have our three winners. The instant runoff way. Thank you, Counselor. Um, so if, you know, if you view, view that example and then go to the tabular thing that's in the documentation that's with your agenda, you can see precisely how it all happens in a fractional way. Counselor Elkins, did you have anything else? Okay, Counselor Nash. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Um, Bob and Kathy, thank you for doing all of this. <laughs> um, and so I, my, my concern about using the weighted inclusive Gregory method is that it's a little more complex than most people can wrap their heads around. And I'm, I'm wondering if there were other methods that were considered that, um, that might might be a little more straightforward, um, especially once you get into fractions. I, I mean, teaching people fractions, you can talk to any math teacher. <laughs> and, and this isn't, I, I, I hope you're not feeling criticized here, but I, I'm, I'm just saying that in terms of us going out there and doing the educating, that I, I think that's gonna be the, the, the biggest barrier. And that, um, so if, if you could just, Give us a, a, a little overview as to what those other methods might have been that would not have been, that, that may have been straight, more straightforward, but may have had some very large faults to them. Uh, I'll go first and then Catherine can, can add on. Um, uh, we looked at four or five different methods. And we looked at, looked at them on the basis of a 200 ballot election. And we chose this method as have a lot of other municipalities like Minneapolis and Minnesota and Utah and, and all the rest. Um, we chose this recognizing that it's a little more complicated because it, it provides the most defensible outcomes. And some of the other methods, and you'd have, again, it took us a number of hours to do this. Um, some of the other, some of the other uh, options provide, out, provide surprising outcomes that were not defensible. And in fact, caused uh, real problems in some municipalities, including uh, removing ranked choice voting. And as a result of that, um, among, if you reflect on the, the five criteria that we outlined as, as to what went into our decision-making, uh, we chose this one as did Amherst and as have others, because to us, um, the fact that fractions are perhaps a little harder to wrap your head around, um, the outcomes were more accept acceptable, and that that was the that in essence was the decision of the committee. Catherine, thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll add um, my comments from a slightly different perspective, and that being from the voters' perspective. So, when I go in to cast my vote in a ranked choice uh, on a ranked choice ballot, um, and um, my, 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 the expression of my wishes in that election 
is more completely, more fully um, included in the results using the weighted inclusive Gregory method. And let me explain what I mean. Um, one alternative that we considered would have um, would have allowed for the the when when a candidate is eliminated in in a round because it's the lowest it's the lowest one um uh and then those votes get transferred up um that's pretty easy to understand right and and um that's kind of a basic rank choice voting um method um and so one way of doing it is only to do the ranked choice up, right? The, the transfers up. And that's great for me as a voter. If my candidate is, is eliminated in the first round, well, thank heavens, I've got my second choice and I'm not, I can still participate, right? In just making the decision. Um, however, if my candidate has exceeded the threshold, on the first round, in the in the um, in the method that only uses um, bottom up transfer, eliminated vote, uh, eliminated candidate transfer, my vote is now kind of irrelevant. I'm out of the picture for the remaining choices mm -hmm. um, because my vote would have been um, used for my first choice. Great. But I don't really, it doesn't, it may not count as much for those subsequent races. So in the weighted inclusive Gregory method, a part of my vote will still continue on, will kind of live through the balance of the, um, of the election result calculation, right? In addition to my second choice of my third choice, my, that, the, that, that, that fraction of that vote um, that's not needed for my first choice to win is still able to be used. So my wishes as a voter are more effectively, more thoroughly, more completely realized using the weighted inclusive Gregory method. Um, I will say, I will also add that I had to be convinced um, um, over an extended period of meetings, um, that that this was in fact the choice because of exactly what um, you expressed, Councillor Nash, which is um, how um, challenging it seems to uh, to um, to explain uh, to the voting populace, and it's you know my my um, very most deeply held um, opinion that we need to be able to have faith in our election results. We need to trust what's coming out of, of our elections. And in order to do that, people need to understand um, how those votes are being counted. And this is complex. Um, I, and, um, this is the most widely used method of ranked choice voting. The one that we're recommending is the one that is most widely used. It has been successfully used in many municipalities and um, in some in the statewide uh, races. And uh, so I, you know, looking at that convinced me that, that you know, we surely, <laughs> we surely can, can educate our voters um, successfully to embrace this um, this new method of, of voting in Massachusetts. Does that answer your question? Mostly, and I'm gonna I want to do a follow up, but I, I'd like to pass the the um, pass the um, the floor on to uh, Councillor Foster because I know she's just barely hanging in there today. So. <laughs> <laughs> But but I, I defer to <laughs> Councillor Jarrett to recognize her. <laughs> yes, Councillor Foster. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
And I hear what you're saying about this method, actually. And as you were talking, um, Catherine and, and Bob, that really helped to clarify, like thinking about a race where somebody may have a top choice that they think is going to win. So maybe they, you know, this allows them to vo vote for their top choice and their second choice kind of with integrity instead of trying to play a guessing game of, well, this person's probably going to get so many votes. So I'm going to vote for my second, third choice to try to get them in. So I, I really get that. Um, and actually clarifying questions I have are for Pam, um, if you don't mind, Pam. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. Well, I guess you knew. That's um, okay. Yep. Yeah. My questions are more um, just on the city side and your perspective with managing the election and calculating the results. Um, you know, if where the city's at with uh, technology we currently have, purchases we would need to make, what it may cost. And then also, I'm curious, um, I guess the software is probably quite quick, but I'm wondering if it would end up being longer to see election results in a race with multiple candidates. Well, you know, first, let me just say that elections are always a stressful, you know, a, a stressful day because we begin at seven o'clock in the morning and we go until eight o'clock at night. And the introduction of um, the tabulation software may mean for a city like Northampton that um, we get preliminary results on election night just as we normally would but that the, um, the actual application of the ranked choice voting software um, could or may likely happen the following day. And the reason for that is that, you know, a lot of times we don't even get the final um, person or voting precinct coming in sometimes until 11 o'clock at night. And that might make it a little bit difficult to sort of evaluate um, and make sure that we're running the software the way that it's intended. Um, so how, what it would look like is that the actual ballot will be different, right? Because you'll rank every candidate that's on your ballot. Um, and then the tabulation software will in fact read just as it reads today. So where ranked choice voting comes in is after the election is closed out, we get an initial printout, which will can still be shared at the voting precinct, but then the actual um, uh, software that runs the scanner will need to be brought back to the city clerk's office and um, run in the tabulation software that we don't currently have available today. Um, so it would probably be somewhere between eight and nine thousand dollar investment for the city to purchase the equipment uh, which is probably something like a laptop and the software that goes along with it uh, to conduct that after election uh, tabulation at the very end of the election. So, um, you know, you there, the, I mean, we've talked about the fact that, you know, that for close races, you may not be able to determine on election night. Um, you know, who the, the ultimate winner or winners are going to be. Um, but, um, you know, if this is the prefer preferred method of elections, it's certainly doable from a process perspective. So I hope that that answers some of your questions. It does, thank you, is the process, that your perspective on process was what I was really interested in, so thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it, it definitely will require us getting a group of people together to sort of look at, you know, fine tuning what that process is ultimately going to be. Um, you know, but I think it's it's very doable and and uh, we have a great support network with our friends at LHS. 
Uh, LHS is the company that sold us the Dominion software uh, and the tabulation um, equipment that we use today. Um, and they've been very instrumental in helping us to uh, conduct um, mock elections and take a look at what the results and the outcome are gonna be based on a whole set of criteria that we set forth um, to sort of see how, what um, uh, options there are in the, the tabulation software that, that could help us um, do as Catherine mentioned, um, and that is to predict, um, you know, to sort of make sure that the voters' pers pers um, intent can be determined um, based on the ballot that they submit. Um, just as a follow up, uh, if, are you done, Councillor Foster, anymore? Yeah. Um, write in candidates. Uh, how how is that handled, uh, and does that present would that, would that require manual tabulation uh, if they, if there was say a significant write in? Um, yeah. Well, to, well today, um, you know, just as the there is an adjudication process of sorts today, um, the write in candidates have to be done um, before the ballots actually come back to City Hall. Um, so we do have some sort of understanding of what write in candidates there are. Um, and but the actual finalization of those write in candidates. Um, will have to take place after you know we close down the election, um, and it's only in those really um, you know we've had a couple of um, close write-in uh, candidate elections. Um, of course, you're probably familiar with which ones I'm referring to. Um, and you know th those are something that we could probably um, work into the tabulation software um, if we know in advance. But for those that aren't, you know, that we're not able to predict prior to the election, um, and we have no knowledge about, um, those will have to be done on election night. And then the adjudication process of getting them all together will happen um, at the very end before we close out the election. Thank you. Councilor Labarge. Yes, Pam. I'm glad I heard about write-in candidates. What we've had people before who ran on stickers. What happens with that? Well, the process would essentially be the same. Um, you would you know, put your sticker on the ballot in the write-in location and then after the election is closed out, the t you know, th those, um, the write-in candidates have to be hand tallied. So that piece of it will still continue for every election and that process will remain the same. Okay, thank you. Also to Pam, I think I heard you say it would cost eight to $9,000. That is yes. for the equipment. Right. That allocates for every pre-stake at 8,000 to 9,000. That's for a primary and then the regular election. Right, so you'll recall, Councillor Labarge, um, I think uh, um, Chair Bull Rice had mentioned that we this would eliminate preliminary elections in the city. So we wouldn't have those. Um, but essentially what this is, is um, it's one laptop for the entire city okay. that will be placed in the city clerk's office with that software. Okay. So everyone will bring back their software from their individual machines. And then those results from the individual machines in the 14 polling locations will be downloaded into this one particular uh, software. And um, a computer, I should say, and then the software will will uh, 
churn the data to get us the, the, the total summary for the entire city. Thank you, Pam. So yeah, so it's the purchase of that one unit plus the software, plus um, the uh, preventive maintenance, whatever we need to purchase to yeah. keep it up and running, so. Plus you have to pay for the staff also and every precinct, correct? Right, so that so that won't change. the The staffing at the polling location is dictated by by Massachusetts state law. We're required to have certain people there, um, but the there will not be any additional staff as a result of using ranked choice voting. Okay. We we may choose to do that in the very beginning. Um, to help people, you know, sort of understand the ballot. We can't help them to figure out who to vote for, but we certainly can help them how, um, you know, in terms of how to mark the ballot and how to uh, make sure that they have the right um, information on how ranked choice voting will um, be conducted in the city. Okay, thank you so much. Councilor Moulton. Thank you. Uh, thanks again to Bob and Kathy for all the work that you and your committee did on this. Um, I, I, well, I share uh, Council President Nash, uh, Nash's uh, concern about uh, that, that this, this is a rather daunting to explain to the average voter. The selling point, I think, is that it will keep every voter in the game for as long as it lasts with the, both the bottom up reallocation and the excess votes for candidates who have passed the threshold. So if they're, to use a baseball analogy, if there are nine rounds, nine innings, you'll be playing for all, all nine innings. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the important selling point, as well as the fact that it's been used successfully. And I believe the, the committee believes uh, that, uh, that Minneapolis is a good model for educating voters about this. Uh, we can uh, use their educational um, program as a, as a template in Northampton. Um, can I follow up? Can I speak? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, following up what Catherine described in terms of having her particular vote play out throughout the throughout the whole process. I would just like to compare, if I can, simply, well, the advantage of this weighted, inclusive Gregory method to one of the other methods, and that's the Cambridge method. And Cambridge has been doing it since 19, 1940 and you know loves the way they do it, and et cetera. Um, however, our method is better. And I wouldn't say that to my friends in Cambridge, but I'm saying it to you. And the reason that our method is better is because of the inclusive, inclusive part of the weighted inclusive Gregory method as compared with how Cambridge does it. As you have seen, how we would do it would be to transfer fractional portions of every vote cast for a candidate that was elected. So everyone who voted for a candidate who got elected would have her fractional vote transferred to the number two, say 20%, as in the example that we saw. 20% um, of my number two vote would go to the number two person. In Cambridge, they don't do that. What they do is they select 20% of the ballots. So that's only one out of every five ballots. And then they transfer the vote that's in that ballot. So in their reallocation process, the expression of only 20% of the voters remains in the game, as Councilman Moulton pointed out. The way we're gonna do it, and the reason why three other cities in Minneapolis have followed, in Minnesota, excuse me, have followed Minneapolis's lead in using this particular method is that the expression of all the voters stays in the game 
as long as possible. And that's why the committee said to you in what we're in what we are recommending best reflects the 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 feelings of all of the voters in in total and, and that I hope you understood that but that that essentially is why this particular method is the one that is held sway in 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 the municipalities that have successfully implemented ranked choice voting thank you for that councilor nash thank you alex um Councilor Jerry. <laughs> um, Either you can call me. I, you know, yeah, I'm trying. You know, I got off a plane. I'm still a little fuzzy. <laughs> so maybe let me try asking this. I was asking from the best side. Maybe so because um, Bob, you mentioned this. You know, most defensible, and that tells me that there's like something bad that can happen. So um, what is it we're avoiding? By by using this method, you know, like what what are some outcomes that were just like, oh, this this was terrible. So, and then okay, I'm going to follow up on on the way Kathy, you know, you know, presented her her um, presented her thinking in the matter. Um, if you use the if you use the bottom up allocation, the expression of the voters who voted on candidates who did not get elected is going to be expressed in the number two votes. That has the potential of surprising um, the voters who voted in the majority for the one, two, and three candidates. Um, it, it, has, it, it has caused some disruption in some places. So, an example could be the person who won the first round could be knocked out in the second or third round. We saw that happen in a couple of circumstances in the 200 ballot samples that we ran according to those, those options. That is the case, Councilor. Not, and then not, not necessarily the, the number one, but the number two and three in a three person race. So you could end up with a situation where somebody did really well in like the third and fourth rounds and carries the day, but they were in last place in the first round. That sort of outcome, yes. And in fact, that phenomena has caused, has caused ranked choice voting to be taken, to be, be, be removed in, in certain jurisdictions. Okay, so based on that, I'm willing to teach people fractions. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, the, the, so um, yeah, I, I think we have some work here, but um, yeah, that explanation is really helpful. Are there other counselors who have questions before I go to members of the public? Uh, Clerk just, Powers. So I, th I think our, our timeline and our process will um, be that this will go back to city council for you to vote on whether or not to um, accept the council's, I mean, uh, the committee's recommendation, right? And then if that is the case, then the mayor will likely move this forward to the state legislature. Parallel to that, we've been asked by Representative Sabadosa to have the elections division review the, um, the language for any concerns that, that you know, might be contrary to state law. So the, and I think that that is the plan that we will you know, certainly do that because if we don't do it ourselves, then we know that uh, this, the uh, representative Sabadosa suggested that the, the legislative committees will do that and you know, make sure that the elections division has a chance uh, to review it. I also understand that there is the, the need to put this on the ballot. Um, and so we're gonna have to try to figure out with uh, attorney Seawald what, it, what the, edu the voter education is going to, is going to look like um, 
either at some point around when this question is on the ballot, because you probably are already aware that we, we, we have to remain neutral when presenting this particular question to the voter. Mm -hmm. We can't advocate for it um, and we can't use any sort of city resources mm -hmm. to promote a question that's going on the ballot. So that's gonna be something that the city council, myself and the executive branch are going to you know, have to figure out uh, prior to this question being placed on a city ballot. How is that education going to happen, and how can we be sure that it's neutral uh, and doesn't promote what what uh, you know the the ranked choice voting method? You, you've okay. seen you've seen how it was done in in Minneapolis, and independent agencies band together to put together educational things. Right. One Hope right. that's going to be the case here. Um, you know, I have this. I have this notion. Amherst is in a similar circumstance as us, and to me, it, a, a wonderful outcome would be if we go up to the legislature. The legislature blesses us and blesses Amherst, and then we do a co. We 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 encourage a cooperative effort from some of these independent advocates to, to work together on the electorate of both cities. If, if it doesn't happen that way for us, um, we are left to be doing this in 2025 rather than 2023. Hence, mm -hmm. you know, hence the urgency that the, the committees felt in trying to get something to you meaningful um, and efficiently in order that a sooner rather than later outcome can be achieved. Uh, I saw Councillor Labarda's hand. No, nope. no. Nope. Okay, Councillor Elkins. It seems to me when this, um, when that question of uh, voter education kind of go along the lines of, uh, for instance, like the over the override um, votes that we've had or um, municipal. Uh, broadband where some some election committee is, is formed and, and they're tasked with raising funds for the you know for the education and then of course like the override mayor narkowitz you know was was free he's free to he was free to advocate and and so certainly within that it's just the clerk's office that has to remain remain neutral mm. um i i think i think the 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 education component of this is going to require a, 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 a little bit more of an initiative uh -huh. um, and fundraising, more like a, a typical uh, campaign um, than than other other ballot questions have been before us. But um, I, that's a good point that you raised, uh, Pam, to to tee uh, you know to tee up that the, 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 that the campaign around this and the education. Mm -hmm around it just so people know what they're voting are it might be sort of beyond many other ballot questions we've faced before. Yep. Councillor Perry. Yes, so I've been timidly raising my hand to and fro because education was really uh, something I, I honed into because mm -hmm. you know, we, we are living in a time where I feel like voting rights are being eroded. And so I'm, I'm very heartened by the fact that we are trying to um, you know, do the opposite in Northampton. But I, I think that it is a gargantuan task to try and educate our population. And, um, you know, I know that Robert had mentioned that education will come later, but I was wondering if there are other examples of the Minneapolis of cities who, are, who have tried to implement this that you can maybe send to, to me or other counselors so we can see what failed because while it's nice to look at another city, Northampton is very unique in our population. Um, so I, I just ask that if there's anything else I can look at or we can all look at to awesome. see what education will look like um, because we, we do want to be ahead of this curve because there is a, a huge learning curve. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a time where everything it seems in our world is being upended, whether it's because of the pandemic and, and things that are happening. So to 
to believe that something as fun, like as impactful as changing how we vote is just going to easily pass through where people are going to process it. I think, um, you know, we have to be cautious of that. So is, are there other examples of, of things you could point us to? Uh, resources are abundant, Counselor. Um, to, to start with, just go to the, the fair choice site that is in your agenda, right? And then also, I, I encourage you strongly to visit our friends at Voter Choice Mass, Voter Choice MA. Um, Andy and Greg have, have been super. Their websites are full of information. Um, it's, it's, that's where you should start. <laughs> you know, start with, start with the local folks, Voter Choice MA, go to Fairville, and, um, and that would be a good start for you. Um, and then beyond that, there's, it, it's pretty easy to find uh, resources on what other, New Jersey's, New Jersey's done a great job. The state of New Jersey's done a great job. The state of Maine has done a great job. So there's a lot out there. I wouldn't presume um, to suggest what would be the best for Northampton, but I would again, the reason that we can keep coming back to Minneapolis is that they did such a comprehensive effort and it was so successful that other municipalities in Minnesota have gone that way. So, I mean, that's a real good model, but um, a whole lot of what you, you would wanna look at is available in the two places that I've suggested. Um, let me just, um, I, I have something to add and also I need to apologize. I need to leave this meeting um, now to start another one. And I apologize for that. I'm very grateful for your interest and your great questions and, and the thought that you're putting into this. And so my, the one piece I wanted to add, um, Councillor Perry, one thing that um, some municipalities have done or states um, when they've adopted, moved to adopt this is um, a mock election using the, you know, so, so I think in one of them, it was like, what's your favorite park, you know, or what are your three favorite parks, right, to kind of show the, show the multiple winner scenarios, and, um, and, and done some work with something like that, so people get used to using the ballot, and they can see results tabulating, you know, kind of in real time on, on a, and an online site or something like that. So um, I think that there are some really good opportunities for education. And anytime we're talking about voting and a change in voting or, or anything about that, it just raises the profile of the, the electoral process and how important it is. And I'm excited that this will do that for Northampton and will get even more people interested in voting, actually voting, uh, registering to vote. Um, so I think it will actually have added benefits um, in addition to just the task, which is, which is large of explaining this new way of doing things. I think it's a really exciting opportunity. So again, I'm sorry that I need to leave now. I, I'm, you know, delighted to continue to be part of um, whatever we need to do. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your work, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, very much. It, it, but your okay. concern, Counselor, is, is well taken in the erosion of voting rights. Um, one of the, it would certainly be wonderful if we could continue the momentum that was seen in Northampton in the last election where 68% of, of voters endorse this. I mean, we, we feel there is momentum and we'd like to, we'd like to leverage that momentum. Okay, um, I want to be mindful of the time as I know City Services does have other items to take up. Uh, are there any other questions from counselors? Uh, any from members of the public? Saw a hand earlier. Andy or Greg? Andy had his hand. Oh, there yep. he is again. Good. Great, Andy. Hey, um, so I just wanted to uh, make a follow up comment about the, the rounds of voting that are used in ranked choice voting. There's 
there's only a winner after someone has reached the election requirement. Before that point, there are only leaders. So it's, uh, we try to avoid that language of saying someone has won the first round. Um, and uh, because it can, you know, again, they might not win the second round. So we want to emphasize, you know, it's, it's that requirement, that election requirement that's important to, to talk about during education. Um, so people don't think that their guy won, but now he's lost, which is a very common refrain from um, opponents. Because you know, there are people out there who don't completely understand it. So that's that's the comment I wanted to make. Thanks. Oh, also, I'll just mention voter choice is definitely going to be involved in helping to educate the people of Northampton you know, when this is brought up for, for voting. So, and we are continuing to be accessible for questions between now and the final election day. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I would, uh, we need to do a motion from each of the committees um, what their, about their recommendation. So uh, legislative matters, I'm looking for a recommendation. Moulton, Councilor Moulton. I uh, move that we, uh, we send this to the council with a uh, recommend to approve. Positive okay. recommendation. Yes, positive recommendation for the uh, committee's uh, report. I second and that. Second that. Great. We have a motion and a second. And with city services, uh, do I have a, a motion for a recommendation? I, I will make a motion for a positive recommendation. And I'll second that. Okay. So the item is on the floor in both committees. Uh, discussion. So I will um, give my my thoughts. Um, you know, I, I have heard the concerns about it being a complicated procedure. Um, and, uh, but once I understood it, it makes tremendous sense. Um, you know, I love the, the opportunities for the anti gerrymandering uh, that were described in some of the, the websites that I looked at, um, having a vast majority of the, of the voters uh, electing someone that they are having a, a stake in uh, in that, um, in, 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 you know, in, in each round um, and not, want, not having to worry about wasting votes or, or strategic votes, strategic voting. So um, I think it's worth the education that we'll have to do um, mm -hmm. and I'll be supporting this. Any other discussion before we take a roll call? Okay, seeing none, uh, let's do legislative matters first on a positive recommendation to city council. Councilor Elkins? Yes. Councilor Moulton? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Jarrett? Yes. So that passes unanimously. Uh, now for city services. Councilor Gore? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Perry? Yes. Councilor Foster? Yes. And that also passes. So this, um, I think just the, <laughs> we're, the Board of Registrars, uh, this has also been sent to, and then we'll take this up um, at our May 19th meeting, uh, as I believe is when we'll, Take it up for our vote. So thanks everyone. Um, so at this point, legislative matters is done. So uh, I would look for a motion. Well, first let me thank um, Bob Boris and Kathy Kay for coming and Andy Anderson and Greg Dennis um, and, and everyone, uh, Clerk Powers for uh, <clears throat> being here as well. Well. <laughs> And I'd take a motion to adjourn legislative matters and then city services would continue. So moved. moved. Second. Okay, roll call. Uh, sorry, I'm just noting the time here. Okay, so Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Back to Bye. Councilor Gore. Thank you. Bye all. Bye. Thanks, Councilor Jarrett.
Councilor Perry? Yes, could could we take maybe a five minute break? Yes. Sure. Thank you.
Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. Those kids are like, are you abandoning me, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> no. We've been waiting for the bears to come back. Oh. Yes. All right, so Becoming right. a nuisance. All right, so uh, Councilor Lombard, you interviewed uh, Paul Popmore for the Prevention Committee Commission. Um, I'm having problems. You're, you're echoing for some reason. Oh, I did you interview Paul Foster Moore for the Conservation Commission? Oh, now I hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, with Paul Foster Moore, um, he lives at 147 Turkey Hill Road, Florence, and his term is April 2022nd through June 2025 and that's to fill a vacancy. I had a lengthy talk with Paul, who I do know as the counselor in Ward 6, but I no longer will have Paul anymore. But anyways, this is the reasons why Paul would like to join the Conservation Commission of Northampton. He feels that joining the Conservation Commission would be the logical next step for him given that he has had the history of citizen involvement in protecting and expanding our public lands. Paul was the co-chair of the Ward 6 Committee to save the Mineral Hills and have them ultimately put into conservation restricted status, working closely with my city councilor, Mary Ann LaBarge, and the planning director, Wayne Feigen. Also, I want to include, we also had Dr. Joanne Prasett, um, who kindly, both her and her husband, Dr. Parr, had hired an environmental specialist for us. This was not an easy job for Ward 6, but we gave it a good fight and we won it. Anyways, Paul, also, we all worked very closely with our planning director, Wayne Biden, which we work closely as well with the North Rio natural naturalist, Lori Sanders, to understand the flora and fauna of the area as we work steadily with the planning board, city council, the conservation commission, and the Castro Land Trust to buy the quarry on Turkey Hill Road and turn it into an area of contiguous wildlife corridors and hiking trails now serving the greater community. And believe me, we had such a collection going on in our ward. People coming with piggy banks, I'm serious, piggy banks to help us hire attorneys to get that quarry. At that point, which Paul is trying to explain is the city at that point in the beginning could not step in, step in so we could go ahead and make that conservation land. We had a concrete business up there with 18 wheelers coming. I had a resident who went out for us because he was retired, went out there early in the morning until the truck stopped six days a week. Finally, I was able to step in a con as a counselor with the building inspector in that because of the amount of trucks coming down that residential area. I don't know if any of your counselors been there. It's absolutely beautiful as conservation land. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of Paul. I'm proud of all the residents of Ward 6 who donated, even artists donated pictures. So we could collect money for that. It was not a cheap process, let me tell you, but we won. Anyways, I, I want to explain a lot about Paul. Anyways, the efforts synthesize him to fragility of our natural resource, which in turn deepened his passionate interest in preserving wetlands and public interest resources from destruction of adverse alterations. Paul has been a member of the Nature Conservancy since the 1980s 
And he is an outdoor recreationalist who has climbed all the mountains in the Anadronics and the White Mountains. He has climbed Mount, which I don't know, K-A-T-A-H-D-I-N several times, Katan several times. I have submitted Mr. Whitney, Mr. Rainier, and Dino. I have seen Kayak in the Gulf of Maine for years, Cape Breton and Prince William Sound of Alaska and primitive and remote areas. I say this is not to boast, but rather to illustrate how much I have thrown myself into nature and all four seasons around North America and how I have come to appreciate clean water, unspoiled permits in my backpacking and paddling. It is all fragile and in need of protection from abusive development. As Paul understands the work of the commission, it is tasked with reviewing development proposals that might potentially pollute surface or groundwater supplies or harm swamps, floodplains, wildlife habitat, and riverfront zones. Its work is consistent with the Federal Clean Water Act and the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act through the Department of Environmental Protection. Paul is inspired by his four friends who have given him so much of themselves to the city. Jim Nash, who co-chairs the board of directors with him at the Cutchins programs for children and families. Dennis Bidwell, former city councilor, George Koha, with whom he recently helped to remove 1.5 tons of trash from a King Street location, and Kevin Lake, who, he, who I have known for years. It's time for me to step up now that I am mostly retired and want to give back to the city where we have raised two sons. I am not content to spend all my time fussing over my lawn and watching too much TV. There's too much to do. And in these troubled times, it feels good to focus on local challenges that have solutions. And I would like to make a motion to approve Paul Foster Moore to the Conservation Commission with a positive recommendation to full city council. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, motion made and seconded. Um, Pam, can you do a roll call? Uh, Councillor um, Perry? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Gore? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have um, a bunch of reappointments. Um, let's see. Brian Adams for the Community Preservation Committee. Um, term July 2022 to June 2025, that's a reappointment. C. Mason Marone for the Conservation Commission, July 2022 to June 2025, reappointment. Emma Cornwell to the Disability Commission, July 2022 to June 2025, reappointment. Martha Lyon to the Historical Commission, July 2022 to June 2025, reappointment. Megan Pack to the Human Rights Commission, July 2022 to June 2025, reappointment. So does anyone wanna make a motion to recommend them as a group? Yes, I would like to take um... Community Preservation Committee, Brian Adams, Conservation Commission, Mesa Maron, Disability Commission, Emma Cornwell, Historical Commission, Martha Lyon, the Human Rights Commission, Megan Payak, um, all as in a group with a positive recommendation to full city council as reappointments. And I will second that. Okay, roll call please, Pam. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Gore? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Perry? Yes. Okay, now we're on to new business. Do any councillors have new business? 
I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Foster. <laughs> I'll make it quick, Councillor Labarge, so you can get something to eat. I, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, for the June meeting, I invited Bill Newman from the ACLU and former councillors Dwight and Klein. They were the three that worked on the original uh, facial recognition technology ordinance. And former councillor Dwight and Bill Newman can come. Um, former councillor Klein is uh, just checking her schedule. Um, so that's uh, just, you know, so we can wrap up that conversation. And also um, Patrick McCarthy, um, did I get that correct? Mayor Shara appointed him as a new central services director, and I would anticipate that being referred to us in June. And what is that for? Uh, central services. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks, Karen. All right. Um, now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion I will make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Um, roll call. Do we get a second? We need a second. I, I thought I heard Councillor Labarge as well, so I took her as the second. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so Councillor Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.